um, before the imaging diagnostic medicine was wrong, the uh, tumors were diagnosed much by cell and by palpation, you know. Um, and there are first anecdotes which tells us yeah, uh, in meningioma there was a, a possibility to diagnose tumor by palpation when they had high pulsedosis. But this was delved with, uh, because therefore the tumors were uh, difficult to diagnose. But surgeons early on learned to localize brain tumor uh, by observation of the neurological symptoms. And as you see in this anecdote, uh, Dr. G was able to make a surprisingly small cranial to me the tumor area because he learned to localize the tumors by interpreting uh, uh, neurological symptoms. And even if the first discovery of the X-ray by Konrad Röntgen from Rhein-Westphalia at the end of the 19th century, it was a real breakthrough in medical diagnostics. Um, but the soft tissue as such as brain and brain tumors remained invisible. But the famous neurosurgeon Krause learned early on to use the X-rays um, of the skull to diagnose the brain tumors by indirect signs of the increased intracranial pressure. And this is one report of a boy who had a tumor in the posterior fossa. And Krause observed that there is a rupture of the lambda suture. And he told the neurosurgeon that he had to operate in the posterior fossa due to the tumor here in this young boy. And another famous neurosurgeon, Walter Dandy, was. by radio pack contrast agent. Agents were either toxic or irritated the nervous, nervous system. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't plus possible for him to contrast this compartment to see the brain and also the brain tumors. But one day he observed that the free air in the acute abdomen was an ideal radiolucent contrast agent to, to de delineate indirectly the brain and also brain tumors. And uh, he transferred this observation, uh, sorry, he observed this, uh, this observation to, to the, uh, the subarachnoid space, he injected the air into this space, and therefore the pneumonia encephalopathy was born was the first method in neuroradiology to delineate brain. And he also was nominated for the Nobel Prize for this observation and for developing this method to the humans. And I will show you very old pneumoencephalography in a normal pa patient and you see the air I don't know if you see the pointer. You see the air in the ventricle and in the basal systems, delineating here the ventricles and also part of the brainstem. You can see here delineation of the fourth ventricle also. And when you have a pons glioma, you see this mess here due to the air in front of the tumor and the fourth ventricle behind the tumor, you are able to see this glioma in the pons indirectly. And of note, there is no obstructive hydrocephalus in this patient. And the neurovascular compartment would be another target to delineate out otherwise invisible brain tumors. But you know, we cannot inject air in this compartment. So the discovery of safe radio pack contrast agent based on iodine was very important to perform the first angiograms. 
And another very important discovery or development is uh, time resolving um, radiography by performing uh, or by, by using um, uh, fast uh, film exchanges who made possible to make serial angiograms. And another very important uh, discovery was the Zeldinger technique because it made possible to perform angiograms with a catheter and therefore the, the direct puncture of the uh, carotid artery in the neck was uh, uh, not, not more necessary. And I think you don't, you aren't familiar with these angiograms in diagnosis of brain tumors. And I will show you some modern angiographies with the most important signs to diagnose gliomas. You see here an angiogram of the carotid artery and you see a tumor blush here. But more important than this is the early draining vein, which you can see here. And this vein is contrasted before the other veins can be seen. It tells you that there must be a more malignant glioma here. This was the oligodendroglioma even without contrast enhancement. But however, it was a grade three, and this was diagnosed, uh, uh, diagnosed by the early vein. Another very important sign of more benign tumors is, uh, um, is here the displacement of the vertebral artery compared to the other one, which has a normal one here. You see that it is back, uh, backward displaced. And you don't have a tumor blush. And in this case, it was here a chordoma from the clivus, um, which caused this backward delineation of this artery. And this is quite different. Here you see a small tumor blush from a tumor which uh, is um, supplied by the external carotid artery. And this is typical for the meningioma. And here another tumor, which is supplied by the internal carotid artery. You have a huge tumor blush, uh, which was a hemangioblastoma. And even though the MR and also the CT has um, replaced the angiograms, there might be cases uh, nowadays which are difficult to diagnose where the angiogram together with the MRI, make really sense to uh, diagnose these tumors. But around the same time, in the middle of the 20th century, um, another method was introduced for tumor imaging. It was the scintigraphy. More postulated that some brain tumors could selectively take up radio tracer. About 10 years here, this large uh, study with over 400 brain tumors could prove the diagnostic power of this scintigraphy. And about 50 years later, the hypothesis of more could be proven by the introduction of this uh, tracer, the Elta resign, uh, which is a fat. And uh, this uh, tracer has a very high uptake in the brain tumor, even in higher brain tumors in the gliomas compared to the negligible uh, uptake in the normal brain. But the disadvantage of this method was this was a uh, 2D measurement and you only had a lateral projection of the whole brain. And it wasn't possible to, uh, to, to localize the brain tumor inside. 
and therefore the discovery of coal was really in the first 3D revolution in tumor imaging. Um, he was the father of the sectional imaging uh, by this, uh, the discovery of a rotational tomography. And you see here the first image of the section of the brain and you can localize the brain tumor here in the right frontal lobe. And together with Edwards, he um, also uh, developed uh, newer scanners from time-resolved scanning, 3D scanning. And they were the first to perform the um, quantitative brain perfusion also in brain tumors, as you can see here, a first image of this group of a brain glioma here. And they uh, labeled the red blood uh, by technicium and were able to measure the blood uh, um, brain volume and also the, the damage of the blood, blood brain barrier. And they were the first to consider that the high-grade glioma have an increased CBB and also a damage of the blood-brain barrier. And Hounsworth then was the father of the first so-called X-ray machine, as it was called before, the 3D X-ray machine, which was a CT. And this scanner was employed by a pencil X-ray beam with a single photomultiplier detector to transmitted X-rays. And it operated on a translate rotor principle. And the first images um, uh, uh, from these scans took more than two hours to be re reconstructed by a computer outside the scanner. But it was, uh, wasn't the first man who um, observed that the 3D modus must be very interesting for um, the diagnostic of brain damages. It was Oldendorf before, and he observed an engineer when he worked on an apparatus um, which, uh, which was able to take 3D images from fruits and he used this method uh, to detect dehydrated portions of damaged fruits. And Oldenburg thought that scan, uh, scanning a head through transmitted beam of X-ray must be also possible to diagnose uh, damages in the brain. And he also get the patent for this observation. Another revolution was um, the introduction of modern contrast agents with, which were very safe and well tolerable. Um, also, when you inject it into the veins and into the subarachnoid space. And therefore, it was possible to diagnose brain tumors by the injection of the contrast agent either in the Subarachnoid space, the CT myelography or post myelography, and also intravenously. And it was the first time that um, the uh, that you can you could clearly see a brain tumor by the enhancement. But today we know that there are many gliomas we, uh, which do not enhance, and we also know today that the contrast enhancement is only one uh, piece of the puzzle for the diagnostic. And it's very interesting that early on, um, there is an author, author which observed the pseudo progression in the brain tumor. And this is a problem of contrast enhancement, which is not resolved nowadays. And here you see some very old images of a post myelic CT, and you can diagnose this tumor in the midbrain here. And it's hard to see, but also in the pons, 
by the um, indirect delineation of the brain tissue. But while the CT diagnostic continued to develop, completely different method was detected and developed towards the end of the last century, the use of the magnetic spin to visualize soft tissue. And this was really a breakthrough because we know that the soft tissue is uh, much better delineated with this me method compared to the CT. But before the sectional imaging was introduced, um, a Damon, uh, a Damadian, it was one of the inventors of this method, had another idea. He wanted to develop a whole body tumor scanner. Because he observed that the T2 and especially the T1 relaxation time in the brain tumors is longer than the T1 relaxation time in the normal tissue, except of the lipoma, who has a very short, uh, which has a very short T1 relaxation time. And therefore, he thought um, if in the body there is an area with increased T1 relaxation time, this machine should detect that there is a tumor. But you know that it is what was uh, very important to introduce the sectional imaging also in the MRI by Paul Lauterburg uh, by applying magnetic field gradients in addition to the um, magnetic field. And here you see one of the first MRI images from him. It was a living mouse here. Um, and um, it's hard to, to see the mouse in this picture, I think. <laughs> so we are better now. And uh, uh, Peter Mansfield was also very important in the development of the MRI because he introduced the epiplanar imaging, the AP, uh, in this field. And therefore, it was able to shorten the examination time. And this is one of the very first study investigating brain tumors by MRI. And interesting, this author also used the relaxation time, the T1 relaxation time, to differentiate different brain tumors here in the astrocytoma, norinoma, and metastasis. They had longer T1 relaxation times compared here to normal, to many tumors and especially of the lipomas. And then the contrast agent gadelium based was also introduced in the uh, medical diagnosis and it was firstly in Germany where it was introduced because uh, they had less restriction um, uh, compared to the USA. And these authors early on recognized that uh, the contrast is able to separate vital brain tumor tissue here from the necrosis and from the edema. And another revolution was the introduction of the diffusion weighted imaging, and this was um, Le Bihan who observed that the diffusion can be measured, that the diffusion uh, can be measured by MRI um, by applying this diffusion gradients. And also it was the stroke, um, uh, firstly, which was discovered with the diffusion MRI. Um, Le Bihan also observed that the diffusion is important to diagnose gliomas, as you see in a very old uh, image here from this uh, author. And mostly then observed the anisotropic diffusion in the white matter. And he observed that uh, this, uh, this by, the, by using the diffusion uh, tensor imaging, you can map the white matter uh, fiber orientation based on this method. And again, as well, it was Le Bihan um, who firstly um, uh, performed the first tractographic images of the white matter based on this method. 
and in Peter Basser, uh, or Besser, I don't know if it's a French colleague, um, Le Bihar had, had a very important colleague in the research of the DTI method because he elaborated mathematical models to calculate and to quantify an isotropic of diffusion, as you can see here from this original paper from Butler. And we are still happy to have this method because we use it not only in the new science, but also in the pre-operative planning. Um, and we use it in uh, combination with the functional MRI. And uh, the functional MRI uh, was really very early discovered here only 20, uh, 10 years after the commercial uh, distribution of the MR scanners, Ogawa observed that you can measure the function of the brain. Um, so based on the principle of the neurovascular coupling, the brain function can be detected by the blood uh, uh, oxygen level dependent contrast on the T2 star images we know it as bold contrast. And therefore, we are able still today to, um, for, it's very important for us for the preoperative tumor diagnostic, for example, to determine the language dominant hemisphere and in this patient with the left hemisphere. here. And you know that we can also track the um, arcuate fascicle um, which connect the most important language areas. And we use it for the pre-operative planning also uh, in the motor area. And it is very important, as you can see here, two more and the functional areas. And the diffusion and also the IVM was early um, on, was, was recognized early on as very important uh, diagnostic tools also for the brain tumors. But as we know today, there is no real breakthrough of these methods in, in the routine, uh, except for the diffusion weighted imaging to see postoperative infarction or something like this. But it's more important to use the DTI. But the IVIM here, the intravoxel incorrect motion, um, which was also, also um, discovered by Libiha, has a renaissance uh, nowadays. Uh, and we will see if we, uh, if we can introduce this method in our diagnostics. And the IVM measure the microscopic perfusion, but the macroscopic perfusion can be measured also by T2 star images. And these are one of the first images of a brain perfusion here. And you can see here that there is a signal loss in the cortex, but not in the thalamic tumor. And this tells us that there are many vessels here in the cortex compared to the white matter and that the brain tumor here hasn't a neovasculature and this was a low-grade glioma and this was one of the first images from this perfusion technique. And also the arterial spin labeling was introduced very, very early on but this method has a disadvantage that um, the uh, contrast uh, is very low because the labeled spins here are a negative contrast agent and you know uh, you need uh, um, uh, uh, much uh, measurement repetitions um, until you can really quantify the perfusion and therefore this method is uh, has a, is, is, has a too long measurement time. And with the spiral volumetric CT, the brain perfusion is also possible uh, with the CT, but nobody the CT uh, perfusion is applied for the stroke 
and um, there are all these SARS studies investigating brain tumors because these patients um, are examined with the MRI and uh, rather seldom with a CT. But the perfusion uh, get a hype until today in MRI because it's a very important technique not only to diagnose a tumor but also for the uh, grading and uh, especially to monitor the treatment effects. But when you see publications here from the perfusion here from the ASL and also from the structural MRA, uh, from the DTI, you may see that there might be um, a hype here at 2017, I think, but this hype will get, uh, get over here in the Nova days. And the reason for this might be that the artificial, uh, the, um, the, uh, the AI and the machine learning get more and more important in the diagnosis of the gliomas. But we have to ask is, uh, if this is only a new hype or what is the reason for that? So I think that uh, structural MRI and also DTI and perfusion might be very important tools to diagnose a tumor, but it's only a piece of the puzzle. And more important than the epi, than the phenotype of the tumor, might be the genetic and epigenetic classification of the brain tumors. And this method, as I told you, only get the uh, uh, phenotype of a tumor, the morphology and something of the function, but not a genetic and epigenetic uh, profile of a tumor. The graphs of the grading of diffuse gliomas make it clear that once again, how small the proportion of the morph morphological criteria has become compared to the genetic tumor profiles. You see here, these are the mor morphologic uh, criteria, and these are the genetic and epigenetic criteria to, uh, uh, to decide if a tumor is a low grade or a high grade one. So therefore, we with our imaging, we get the morphology and not the genetic or epigenetic. And maybe one uh, solution for this uh, may be the metabolic imaging because it is much closer to the epigenetic and the genetic of a brain tumor. And since now, we uh, performed the morphological uh, um, tools also to make machine learning. And in the future, it might be more important to introduce metabolic imaging like the spectroscopy, CEST, or even PET imaging uh, to get a more uh, sophisticated data for the artificial intelligence. And this is my last slide, and I thank you for your attention.